Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We're excited about hearing what you have to say to us and continuing to grow in our walk with you and being able to enjoy the journey. Thank you. Help me as I minister your word and help people listen and retain what they hear. Amen. Amen. Doing a series called I'm Okay and I'm On My Way. I'm not where I need to be. Nobody here has arrived. We're not where we need to be. And if we don't know that, believe me, the devil will remind us many times a day. We're not where we need to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. We are each one in a different place in our walk with God. But to be honest, if our heart is to grow and we love God, then he views us as just being totally okay. As long as you're on your way, you're okay. Everybody say, I'm on my way. And I'm okay. okay. All right. Now, tonight we're going to talk about the donkey in the ditch. Luke 14, beginning in verse 1. You might think, what in the world is she going to talk about tonight? Well, you'll find out. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. It occurred one Sabbath when Jesus went for a meal at the house of one of the ruling Pharisees. It's kind of interesting, the people that Jesus ate with. I think sometimes he just got together with people just to shock them. (laughs) Do you know that, that, that he purposely did things to shock the religious crowd and to shake them up? You have to understand that the times that Jesus came in were very different than the times that we live in. They were still living under the law that Moses had received on Mount Sinai, which originally was Ten Commandments, but by the time Jesus came, had morphed into 2,200 different rules and regulations that the people were having to follow. You know, that's kind of the nature of the law. It's like it just keeps growing. You know, it's like This law then has to have this law added to it. Then this law has to have this law added to it. And legalism steals our freedom. Jesus came to set us free. And it's not that we don't have any guidelines or or any, I don't really like the word rules, but rules that we need to follow. But they're now written in our heart. God comes to live in us and he gives us a new heart. He says, I'll put, give you a new heart and put my spirit in you. And so the goal now is to be led by the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be led by a written letter of laws on a tablet of stone. And it's interesting to me that they were written on stone, and I believe that was a message to us that they're going to be very hard. They're going to be hard to follow, and anybody who tries is going to end up with a hard heart. God gave the law not because he expected us to keep it, but so we would try to keep it, and find out that we could not keep it and that we needed a savior. That was the whole purpose for the law being given. To find out that we're sinners because without the law we don't even recognize sin. So the law condemns us and says, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you can't keep me, you can't keep me. And no matter how hard we try, we could try so hard that we could even keep nine of the ten, but there's always going to be one that you cannot keep. And when it comes to the Ten Commandments, the tenth one says, not only shall you not do all these things, but you can't even want to do them. Thou shalt not covet. You can't have a greedy heart of wanting to. So even if we could manage to control all of our behavior, no man can change his heart unless he lets Christ come in and do a new work on the inside of him. Somebody say, wonderful, wonderful. And see, the key is, is God doesn't want us trying to serve him out of obligation, rules, and regulations. So he gives us a new want to. He puts his spirit in us, and now we don't pray because we have to. We pray because it's a privilege. And who wouldn't want to talk to the God of all the earth? Who wouldn't want to take our little needs to him and ask him to 
meet our needs. Who wouldn't want to be able to take their cares and their worries to Him and let go of them? We pray because it's a privilege. We're not doing God a favor when we read the Bible. You don't get check marks on your calendar in heaven when you read your three chapters every day. <clears throat> we read the Bible because it's God's Word to us, and it's the smartest book that's ever been written. And if we know what's in it, and we apply it to our lives, our lives will be wonderful, and they will change dramatically. That book will keep you out of trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you know, we always, we, we have a habit of saying, I have to. I have to go to church, I have to pray, I have to study, I have to go to the grocery store. No, you don't. If you don't want to eat, just don't go. <laughs> I have to clean the house. No, you don't. And I think all this have to talk, I really think it puts a burden on us. And I believe we need to start saying, I want to do that. I'm looking forward to going to church tomorrow. I'm looking forward to my, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and have my prayer time and my fellowship time with God. I love to give. I love to be a blessing to people. Not I have to pay my tithe. I have to go to church. I have to read. I have to pray. You don't have to do anything. God doesn't require that we have to, but He gives us a heart of want to. The only thing is, is if you never die to the law, Paul said, I have died to the law so I can now live to Christ. You can't have it both ways. Either you're going to do it by trying to follow the law, you're going to try to be right with God through following the law, or you're going to give it up and you're going to say, God, I can't keep the law. I need you as my Savior. I need you. Come and live inside of me and do what only you can do. And then all of a sudden you can go, oh, praise the Lord. Now, so Jesus just loved to shock religious people by breaking their rules and regulations. And they were ones that they had depended on all their life long. And he was trying to bring a whole new system. He was trying to bring in a new covenant. So it occurred that on a Sabbath, and you know, originally in the Ten Commandments it said, you shall have this Sabbath and not do any work or labor on it. Don't buy or sell. It's a day holy unto the Lord. And it was specifically designed for people to rest from all their labors. But they turned it into something that wouldn't allow them to do anything on the Sabbath. I mean, it became so ridiculous they could not do anything at all. And so they even got to the point where they thought even to do anything good on the Sabbath was wrong. And that's what legalism will do for you. It gets you to the point, honestly, just look at me. If you live a legalistic lifestyle, you will get to the point where you absolutely cannot enjoy anything. You won't be able to enjoy anything. Because everything that you try to do, the devil will tell you that there's some more work to be done somewhere. And you have no right to enjoy yourself until all of that is done. There's always another thing that you didn't do right that you must try to do right before you can ever even dare to think that God might be happy with you. So Jesus went to eat with the Pharisees. I think he had a purpose when he went. And they were engaged in watching him closely because you see, that's what Pharisees do. <laughs> they watch you closely. And behold, just in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful or right to cure on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And then he took hold of the man and cured him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a well will not at once pull him out even on the Sabbath day? And they were not able to answer him at all. What happens when the donkey falls in the ditch? Jesus gets him out. And we are the donkey that often fall into the ditch. And we can be assured that he will come and lift us out. Let me tell you something. God will help you no matter how much of a rascal you've been. And no matter how many times you fall into the ditch, 
Jesus will reach down in there and get you out if you will just ask him to. And he will do it over and over and over and over again. I have a little dog, a little white Maltese. She weighs seven and a half pounds, and we've had her for 12 and a half years, I think, something like that. And she is just so sweet, and we love her so much. And, you know, when you don't have kids at home anymore, then sometimes you get a dog, and you just, you know, come, come to mama, come to mama. It's just it's like the dumbest thing, but that's what we do, you know. Well... She has, in the last year and a half, she started to poo every once in a while in the floor. She'll go off somewhere and poo somewhere in the house. And she knows she's doing wrong because she hides to do it. <laughs> Except not too long ago, I was gone longer than I think she wanted me to be. <laughs> and I was gone like s several days. And the chair where I sit all the time in our family room, she pooed right in front of it, one little poo. And right behind it, one little poo. I think that one was on purpose. I think she was saying, poo on you for leaving me as long as you did. <laughs> but here's the thing. She, so she's got this little poo thing now. She doesn't do it. She'll, she'll go two, three weeks and won't do it. Then she'll do it. We'll find it hidden off in a bathroom somewhere. Or, you know, the other day she got really brave. Went in Dave's office and pooed right in his floor. <laughs> oh, that's a no-no. And, uh, but, but the point is, is... Even though she's pooing in the floor once in a while, I'm not going to get rid of her. You know why? Because she's my dog. And if I have to clean up her poo once in a while, I will, because they're little poos anyway, so it's not really difficult. <laughs> and I just thought this might be a good example for us to realize that, you know, even if God's got to clean up a little poo once in a while, <laughs> He still loves you. Yeah, yeah. He's not going to send you off to the people pound and get rid of you. <laughs> now, we're trying to teach her not to poo. We tell her, no, no, no poo in the house. But still, I have already decided, I know in my heart that even if she keeps it up, I will keep her and not get rid of her. If we can be that committed to a dog, how committed do we think God might be to us? Come on, give God more praise than that. And you say, well, you know, Joyce, I mean, there would be some religious people that would think you can't. You can't tell people that they can just poo and God's going <laughs> to. And God is just going to just put up with that. Well, you, see, you know why I can tell you that? I'll tell you why I can tell you that. I'll tell you why I'm brave enough to tell you that. Because I do not believe that you are people that are just looking for an excuse to sin. You see, I, I very much believe that more than anything, you don't want to sin. I believe more than anything, you want to do what's right. You want God to be proud of you. You want to do everything you can to please Him. And because I know you want to do what's right, I know that God sees your heart. And so it's because of that that when we make mistakes, He will help us clean up our mistakes reach down and get us out of the ditch and keep working with us till he gets us into another glory of victory. God is not going to give up on you. Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. Now we're going to go through a few verses in here, but I'll Stop as I go and do a little teaching. At that particular time, Jesus went through the fields of standing grain on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pick off the spikes of grain and to eat it. Now remember, they had gotten to the point where on the Sabbath day, you could not do anything. Even if you were hungry, legally, you could not go out into the field and pick any grain. You would just have to stay hungry because you were supposed to prepare for the Sabbath's hunger the day before. <laughs> and 
And if you didn't have all that prepared, if for some reason you didn't get it prepared and you were out somewhere and you got hungry, too bad for you. You just had to stay hungry because it was the Sabbath and it was a law. Well, they had taken it way out of context from what God intended it to be. And Jesus was about to shake them up a little bit. <laughs> and when the Pharisees saw that they were picking the grain, they said to Jesus, now see there, your disciples are doing what's unlawful and not permitted on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you not ever read what David did when he was hungry? And those who accompanied him, how he went into the house of God and ate the loaves of the showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for the men who accompanied him, but for the priests only. So in the temple, they had these loaves of bread and it was a law that, all, that they were there for the priests and only the priests could eat them. Nobody else could eat them. But when David's men were out doing battle, they got hungry and he reminded them, don't you remember that David's men went in to the temple and they ate the loaves of showbread and that wasn't lawful for them to eat either. Or have you never read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple violate the sanctity of the Sabbath, breaking it, and yet they are guiltless? Question mark. Now, I remember when God was trying to teach me what I'm trying to teach you here tonight, because I was so legalistic with myself. And for me, it wasn't even, yes, I was part of a church denomination that, that had rules and regulations, but I was not raised in a particular particularly strict religious environment. I was raised in a very strict environment, but it was my father that was legalistic. It didn't come from religion for me. Some of you may have been raised in a very strict religious environment, and it's very difficult when you've been raised like that to ever get to the point where you can just settle down and relax and enjoy a relationship with God. But through His Word, you can do that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If you've been raised in a situation like that, it's hard to just, to just think that you can make a mistake and God is still going to love you just as much and that He's going to help you even and sometimes especially when you don't deserve it. And so I just was legalistic. I was just hard on myself. My father had been hard on me and I was just hard on me. I tried very hard to do everything just right and I turned so many things into rules and regulations even that were not things that had anything to do with the Bible. Even keeping my house a certain way became a law for me. And if I didn't have all the housework done, there was no way I was going to go out and have any fun. If I didn't have all the housework done, I could not lay down on the couch at night and watch a movie and enjoy myself. I would feel guilty if I wasn't up doing something. How many of you feel guilty when you're having fun? Come on, let's see those hands. Now, if you, if you were from where I'm at and you could see this, you could readily understand why it's vitally necessary for me to preach this message to you tonight. Because Jesus would not have put a laugh in you if he didn't want you to use it. He would not have put a desire in us for fun if he didn't want us to have fun. And I'll tell you what, Jesus liked to have fun. He liked to have fun. I think even some of the things he did to the Pharisees, he probably thought was just downright funny. Amen? Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Yes, we need to do our work, but work is never done. So if you wait till it's all done all the time, then you're never going to enjoy yourself. <laughs> never, never. So I, you know, I was very legalistic, very hard on myself. And when you're legalistic and hard on yourself, guess what happens? You become hard on everybody else. So I was hard on my kids. Not, not abusive toward my kids, but I was hard on them. Go play. Clean that mess up. What do you got all those toys out for? I don't know what I thought they were supposed to play with. I'd tell them to go play, but then I didn't want them to have anything out to play with. Get that trash out. Come on, get it. Oh, come on, get that out. Take it out, take it out. And so the more merciful you are with yourself, the more you learn how to receive God's mercy, the more merciful you will be with other people. Come on. And we need to show people mercy. So God kept having me read Matthew 12. Matthew 12, I didn't get it. Okay, they picked grain on the Sabbath. 
They ate the bread. They weren't supposed to eat the bread. Why do you keep making me read this? I'm not getting it. And when I would get to this point where it said they broke the law and yet they were guiltless, my little legalistic brain would just go tilt, 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 tilt. How can you possibly do the wrong thing and not be guilty? Because everything, every time that I did any little teeny tiny thing wrong, I felt guilty. How many of you experience a lot more guilt than you know that you should? See, another whole room problem. People watching my TV, whole world problem. Guilt and condemnation is a huge, huge problem. Now I'm going to tell you something, and this is going to make the devil so stinking mad when I tell you this. Are you ready? And I'm only telling you this because if God can do this for me, then God can do it for you. Guilt was probably one of my number one problems. First of all, from being sexually abused by my father, somehow at some point I internalized that and thought something was wrong with me that was causing him to do that. So I had a shame-based nature and I just felt bad about myself. I had a record playing in my head all the time, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me. So I felt guilty. When I got into a relationship with God, that was great, things got somewhat better, but I still felt guilty all the time. It was now just about new things that I felt guilty about. And God has done such a work in me, and it took a long time and it wasn't easy, but I believe that I can help you fast forward the process. I can honestly tell you, and I hope this doesn't sound goofy to you, I can say that I almost never feel guilty about anything anymore. And I'm glad that you can be happy for me. <laughs> and I want that same thing for every one of you and everyone. You say, well, 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 what kind of a Christian are you anyway? I think a new covenant one finally. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because you see what we have is we've got a lot of new covenant Christians still living under the old covenant. And that's not what God wants for you. We die to the law so we can live to Christ. You say, well, what do you do when you sin? I ask God to forgive me. I receive it, and then I go on. Well, well, well. <laughs> that just rattles the religious brain. And if that rattles the, you, then you've still got a Pharisee in you that needs to die. Because the Bible says that he forgives our sin he forgets them, he removes them as far as the east is from the west, and remembers them no more. So if forgiveness is that complete, I'll never forget when I was feeling guilty about something I'd done, and I was just dragging myself around all day and just feeling so bad. And I mean, honestly, I heard the Holy Spirit speak in my heart, w would you just do me a favor and just get over that and go on because frankly you are of no value to me in that condition. God needs you and he needs you knowing who you are in Christ, knowing that you're just a donkey that falls in the ditch sometimes, but the good news is, is you're God's donkey. Amen. You know, I wish he would have used better examples, you know, like lions and tigers and bears, but no donkeys and sheep, the dumb animals. But even so, you're his donkey, you're his sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, and I am his sheep, and we are none of the devil's business. Listen, if my dog poos on my floor and I'm willing to clean it up, it is nobody's business but mine. It ought to be interesting to see how this message goes when it hits TV.
donkeys in ditches and pooing dogs. You know, sometimes we're going along in life and all of a sudden we just feel like we fell off into a ditch somewhere. We've got a problem that we don't know how to solve. And you know, Jesus is the one who comes and lifts us up. We need to start showing the same mercy toward others that Jesus shows toward us. We need to reach out a helping hand to people. It always enriches our lives when we help others. Je kindertijd. Een tijd om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. En om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen. Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long and come so far upon this road and we've seen mountain high valley low we will battle on
genade en de hulp van al die mensen wereldwijd die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden?